I know that what we're looking at today can be difficult. Um, when, when God set me free 17 years ago and when He reunited my wife and I, our marriage, and um, He did all those miracles, I remember the people that had helped me to get free probably the most they had given us three booklets, and they were small. They could literally, each one of them could be read in a weekend. I'd read two of them. The one was on spiritual warfare, on, on how Christ came to set the captives free. The other one was on um, the marriage covenant and soul ties. And I'd read those multiple times. And the third book was still sitting on my shelf. I'd never opened it. And, uh, and just to give you a, a, a story to sort of help you understand why I'm sharing this. When I was a little boy, probably eight or nine years old, um, my grandmother's brother, my great uncle, all the children in our family loved him. They loved him because he, he bought them all the candy, he bought them toys. He did everything for the children that the parents wouldn't do for them. And, um, you know, if we went up to his house to spend the day, he'd let us watch stuff on TV that our parents wouldn't let us watch. And, um, yeah, my mom and dad should have never allowed me to be around the man because he wasn't a Christian. But at eight or nine years old, he introduced me to things that no man should be introduced to, even as an adult. Um, a magazine that I found in his, uh, in his dresser. And he was like, you want me to go buy one? Let's go to the store. And he went and bought one for me. At nine years old, eight, eight or nine years old. Um, later on, I found out that he had also hurt almost every one of the children that were in our family. And I hated him. I was in ministry. I mean, like, this was probably... I'm, I'm guessing it was 10, maybe, maybe 12 years ago when God finally... Uh, got my attention. We went, my wife and I and our children, we went to a family reunion at my grandmother and grandfather's house. And my great uncle had passed away. Um, he actually lost his mind. He didn't even know who he was anymore. Um, and I'm in ministry, but I had this root that was inside me of bitterness. And n nobody ever brought it up. The man was dead. I didn't bring it up, so it just it was buried. I thought everything's fine. We went over to this family reunion, and my grandmother, who I think was sort of in denial of of what most of the family knew had happened in all these children's lives, um, she started talking about my uncle, and I just I looked at her, and we were there in a big group of people, and I just looked at my grandmother, and I said. Grandma, I said, I would just as soon spit as mention his name. And it's like it got dead silent. Everybody just got quiet. And then I was just like, you know, I'm not going to play this game. Everybody knows what he did. You know, I don't want, I don't want to talk good about it. I don't want to hear any of you all talking good about him. Anyway, a few minutes after that, my wife and I loaded up, got everything in the car, and we're on the way home, and my wife looked at me and she said, she said, you know, your great uncle is dead, but you're still carrying all this anger and bitterness towards him. And when she said that, it all came out of me. I mean, I, I looked at her, I said, I've got every right to be angry at that man. I've got every right to be bitter. Look at what he did to all these different, you know, children and the family. And anyway, my wife just, she was wise and she just left it alone and started praying for me. Well, that was Sunday. Monday morning I woke up and I went out to our ministry office where I usually would have worship. And when I went out there, um, it was one of those times where it's like I'd finished studying whatever I was studying previously and so I was going to start on something new and I could not, nothing was coming to my mind of what I needed to study. And I was like, God, so I started you know, flipping through, just hoping the Lord's going to show me this is where I want you to start reading. Couldn't find anything. Looked, looked, looked. After about 35 minutes, I was just like, you know, I don't know what's wrong. I got up and went to work. Next day, I went out there to have worship. Same thing happened again. I'm reading. I'm like, I'll go to Psalms. I'm reading, and, 
and it's just words. It was like reading newspaper print. It was just words on a page. It was meaningless. And I was like, God, what is wrong? I mean, I'm thinking in my mind, what have I done? You know, I can't think of any sin that I've committed. What have I done? And I finally I cried out to him. I said, Lord, I said, what do you want me to read today? And I looked up. And right there on my bookshelf in front of me was those three books that those people had given to me. And the one on top or on the bottom, I'm sorry, it was on the bottom that I had not read. And it was on freedom from bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness. And I looked at that book and I was like, and I got angry. And I told God, I said, I'm not reading it. Shut my Bible, went to work. I mean, like, I can look at it from an outsider and say, how could you get angry at God? That was the spirit of bitterness that was inside of me that was causing the anger towards God. Because bitterness does not have to be towards one person. If there is a root of bitterness in someone's life, it will affect every single relationship that you have with every person in this life. So that was second day. Third day I woke up. I went back out there. It's like, you know, the devil sort of like, you know, time will wash things away. It'll be fine. I got up to have worship, opened my Bible up. It's just words on a page. And I said, Lord, I said, please, I need to hear your voice. This is the third day. And I looked up and there was that book. And I said, I'm not reading it. I shut my Bible and I went to work. It's four days. And... Finally, by the fifth day, I was, I was overwhelmed. I was like, God, I can't live. I mean, I'm living on like what, what the word that I had eaten a week ago. You've got to have daily manna. I hadn't had any manna for five days. This was the fifth day. And I was like, God, I need help. And the Lord, I mean, as clear as day, it's like my eyes. He turned my eyes and there was that book. And I said, I said, okay, I'll read it. So I started reading. I think it took two days maybe three, to get through it. Um, and God set me free. And I'm, I'm going to tell you how, but I've got to get through some of the other things here. But I want you to know, I know what this is like. Mm -hmm. I know my wife. She, she knows what this is like because of what she went through when, you know, I cheated on her and divorced her and abandoned her and my children. She went through this. And God set her completely free. And she told me afterwards, she said, Eric, she said, I can remember for the first year, maybe two years after the Lord had brought us back together, I was still apologizing to her. I mean, I would go to her and say, Sarah, I'm so sorry. Because it would hit me what I had done. And I would say, I'm so sorry. For... And she looked at me, she said, Eric, stop talking about it. She said, I forgave you before you ever came home. It's gone. You know what? That's what God's saying to us. It's funny because Ellen White says that the Jewish mind, they believed there had to be repentance before God would, would accept you. And she said, you can't even generate repentance except Christ gives it to you. Yeah. So he's, he's the one searching for us. So He gives us the gift of sorrow for sin. He gives us the gift of being able to see what we did so that we will come to Him because He's the one pulling us. It's not like we're seeking God. He's seeking us. And God was revealing to me. He was like, Eric, this, this root has been there for all these years and I need to set you free from it because otherwise it's going gonna, it's gonna to mess up your entire life and mess up your ministry and everything. My son, my daughter, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Yea, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the springs of your life. And the word springs there is what the original is in Hebrew. And I've got a typo. Forgive me. It should be then. Then came Peter to Jesus and said, Lord, 
how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? The Jewish mind said three times. Three strikes and you're out. Ellen White even talks about that. Three times, you're out. And Peter was like, okay, we're going to go to seven, because seven's the number of perfection. Jesus said unto Peter, and unto you and I, I say not unto thee until seven times, but rather until seventy times seven. Four hundred and ninety times. And then you know what people do? They say, 481, 482, 483, and they get down to 490, and they go, you're out. I've done my part now. That's legalism. And I'm going to show you why. He said, For so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. How in the world can I do this? I mean, seven times was huge. How can I do this 490 times? I'm going to go back a little bit. There's a, I don't know if I had this verse up there. I thought I had it next, but I'm going to just tell you. Jesus and another one of the places in the Gospels where he was talking about this, he actually said, if your brother sins against you seven times in a same day, forgive him. And I thought about that and I was like, seven times in the same day, 490 times in the same day, the same sin. And I was like, as messed up as my life has been, I have never committed the exact same sin 490 times in one day. I've had multiple other, but do you understand? Jesus said, forgive. 490 times in one day. That's how willing God is to forgive us. Now, a heart that's broken does not want to keep sinning just because there's forgiveness. But Jesus was saying that's how willing God is. And then Jesus said, But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I desired mercy and not sacrifice. And I desired the knowing of God more than burnt offerings. For he or she shall have judgment or justice without mercy that hath showed no mercy. For mercy rejoiceth against justice. So God says if you are unwilling to forgive, that's how God is going to treat you. And it's not just out of like vindictiveness or anger. It's literally because you have said, I don't want Christ to live in me. Yeah, I want Jesus on Sabbath. I want Jesus on Sunday or on Wednesday night Bible study. But I don't want Him right now when this situation comes up. Jesus is all or nothing. In His patience and His mercy, He's allowing us to learn that. But you can't take Jesus like a buffet and take parts of Him and not the other parts. In Luke, Jesus said, Be ye therefore, therefore full of mercy, as your Father in heaven also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. The word judge there means condemn. It means to, to call, uh, to make a determination over someone's character. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. And then he says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. And when I looked at that, I was like, okay, we're talking about forgiveness here in the verse right above. So what if I put the word forgiveness in there where he says give? Forgive, and it shall be forgiven you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. For with the same measure you measure to others, so shall it be measured to you again. So the way, you know, we talk about this in churches. There's people in churches that are angry and bitter towards other people in their same congregation. In a small congregation like this, it's harder. In a bigger church, it's easy. You just go sit on the other side of the sanctuary. 
You don't talk to them. You, you avoid them, whatever. But we do that with our families. We do that with church members. We do that with all kinds of people, bosses, people we work with. We do that with other ministries. This was the question that came to my mind when I was there that morning when I finally yielded and I told the Lord, I'll read the book. I was like, how? I'm reading the book and I'm like, how do I do that? Because I can get on my knees and say, dear God, I forgive what happened to me and to all the other family members. But inside my heart, there's still ugliness. I'm still angry. I'm still bitter. And I'm like, that, that's a game. God doesn't... That doesn't work. I can't say it and not mean it. And I was like, so how do I do this? And God was like, Eric, you have to be willing to die so that I can live in you. Because I give you my mind, my thoughts, my spirit. The Bible says, let this mind be in us, which was... And Christ Jesus forgave everyone the wrong that they did to him. Even as a little boy, Ellen White talks about the fact that he was picked on quite a bit by the other Jewish boys. He was straight-laced. He was always quoting Scripture, and they didn't like it because they wanted to do something that was against Scripture. So I, I realized the Lord had to show something to me, and He told me, He said, Eric, He said, uh, let me, I'm going to go forward a little bit. There's a place I want to bring that in. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, the word forgive means to give in exchange for. E.J. Wagner talked about that in one of his, his books. Forgive means to give in exchange for. So when I go to God and I say, Dear God, please forgive me for this sin, God says, What do you want me to give you in exchange for your sin? I only have one thing I can give you, and that's Jesus. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. So the Lord told me, said, Eric, in order for you to do this, you have to do what Jesus did. And I, I saw a picture of Jesus laying down and putting his arms out. And you know it hurt. I mean, that's probably the most excruciating pain after everything else he'd went through. And he didn't even open his mouth and cry out. Jesus laid down his life. We did not take it from him. And God revealed personally, he told me, he said, Eric, in order for you to, give the, to forgive the wrong that was done, you have to be willing to say, I'm willing to bear the pain that that man caused. And that scared me when God spoke that to me. Because I, I told the Lord, I said, I don't want to bear the pain. It was easier for me to bear the anger than for me to bear the pain. And God said, there's no other way. If you want Jesus to live inside you, Jesus was willing to bear the pain that was caused him on behalf of those that were causing it. And I told the Lord, I said, in, in my mind, I was scared because I was like, I don't want to carry that pain. I buried that years ago. And God goes, yeah, that root's still there. Buried does not mean you're free. God said, are you willing to bear the pain? That means, are you willing to suffer the pain that he caused? And finally, I was just, I, I was so tired and I was so, I missed God and missed Jesus so much. I said, yes. I said, I surrender. I sur if this is what it takes for me to have you, I surrender. And do you know what happened? The moment I said I would bear the pain, that moment Christ took every bit of it from me. I never felt the pain for one moment. Not one moment. Because Christ said, I'm inside of you. And I'm forgiving what your great uncle did. If you are willing to walk with me, if you are willing to do and let me live my life for you, he says, the moment that pain comes to you, he said, I take it. He said, I care. You know what? I have absolutely not one bad thought towards my uncle. Every bit of the anger, it was gone instantly. The hurt, it was gone. The only thing that I feel now is, 
I feel terrible that even as a nine-year-old boy, when I went to visit my uncle, I should have been sharing Jesus with him. Not eating the trash he was feeding me, not watching the trash that was on his television. I should have been sharing Jesus. And I think, Lord, I know God can do miracles. I think, Lord, if there's any way, I pray that you were able to win his heart before he closed his eyes. And that's, it's like I have no feelings whatsoever bad towards the man. Doesn't mean I said what he did was okay, but I hate to even think about the fact of him waking up on the second resurrection and being lost. Let me show you what the Lord showed me. This deals a lot with family, deals a lot with churches. This is from Life Sketches of Ellen White, written by her. She had a dream or a vision. And she said, In this vision, another book was opened wherein were recorded the sins of those who profess the truth. These are Christians. There were headings over every column. And underneath these headings, opposite each name, our names, were recorded in their respective columns the lesser sins. Under the title of covetousness came falsehood, theft, robbery, fraud, and greed. Under the title of ambition came pride and extravagance. Jealousy stood at the head of malice, envy, and hatred. And intemperance, food, intemperance headed a long list of fearful crimes such as lasciviousness, adultery, and indulgence of animal passions, etc. Intemperance was the heading of the page, and underneath of it came all these things. She said, As I beheld, I was filled with inexpressible anguish, and I exclaimed, Who can be saved? Who will stand justified before God? Whose robes are spotless? Who are faultless in the sight of a pure and holy God? There is another part that she says in the description. It was as if the angel was starting at the back of the book and turning forward. So the angel would turn a page and there was lasciviousness and all the sins under it. He would turn another page and there was covetousness and there's all the sins. And she said he got back to the front page and you know what was on the front page? Every other sin in the book fell under one sin. Selfishness. Selfishness. Every other sin fell under selfishness. So when I say I'm not willing to bear that pain, that's selfishness. When I say I want to eat more than what God wants me to, that's selfishness. When I say I want to treat my wife or my husband the way I want to treat him, that's selfishness. When I say I want to watch what I want to watch, I want to drink what I want to drink, I want to listen to what I want to listen to, even as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, that's selfishness. And none of us will get into heaven with selfishness. None of us. Even this week, when, when, you know, when the Lord was showing this to me, I was like, Eric, you've got to get rid of selfishness. You've got to be willing to die so that Jesus might live in you. Let me show you this. This is a, a, a portrayal of Jesus with the man that had leprosy. I think probably in Luke chapter 5. In Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, Jesus imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, and those possessed of demons. So when Jesus wanted to set a, a person free, or maybe let's, let's take the disciples. The disciples are there trying to cast a demon out. And the demon won't go, like with the man at the, at the foot of the mountain of transfiguration. A lot of times the demon will say, I don't have to leave because they did this, this, and this. 
or because they have this sin still in their life. I don't have to leave. Your law, God says, whoever they yield themselves as servants to obey, that's whose servants they are. And the devil will go back and he can point to the day and the hour and the very minute that you yielded. He'll say, I have every right to be here. I'm not going anywhere. And you know what Jesus said? You're gone. I take their sins. What right do you have now? He imparted His life to the sick, to the afflicted, and to those possessed of demons. He had to impart His life or else the sickness, the disease, the demons had every right to stay. He turned away none who came to receive His healing power. He knew that those who petitioned Him for help had brought disease upon themselves, yet He did not refuse to heal them. Amen. This is forgiveness. Amen. This is forgiveness. That person says, I got every right to be angry. Look what they did to me. Jesus says, look what they did to me. Yet He did not refuse to heal them. In all this conflict with the powers of evil, there was ever before Christ the darkened shadow into which He Himself must enter. Ever before Jesus was the price which He must pay for the ransom of these souls. It wasn't just dying. Remember what we read earlier. He thought He was not going to see His Father's face again. That was the temptation that Satan was wringing his heart with. As he witnessed the sufferings of the human race, he knew that he must bear a greater pain mingled with mockery, that he must suffer the greatest humiliation. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he knew that for that life he must pay the ransom on the cross of Calvary. Every rescue that you and I Every rescue made was to cause Jesus the deepest humiliation. He was to taste death for every man. That's why Ellen White says every single soul in the world belongs to Christ, whether they know it or not. She says they are His by creation and they are His by redemption. The only difference between them and you and I is we believe in Jesus. And the reason they don't believe is because the devil, the God of this world, has blinded their minds. So when we see someone that we think is unforgivable, we've got to remember they're a child of God. They just don't know it. They've already been paid for. And we need to pray. We need to love them, like George said. We need to show compassion and mercy so that they can see Jesus. Job chapter 14, verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. That's like, you know, God asking me to forgive. I can't. I want to. I need to, but I can't. Jeremiah says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. It's not, it's, it's not about head knowledge. It's not about learning a new way of doing something. It cannot be limited to that. There has to be a supernatural change by the Spirit of God inside of us. His life in exchange for ours. When, and we've talked a little bit about this here before, but when, when I watch people that have been in Hollywood or in the music industry or in the occult, and they literally allow evil spirits to come into them. And when those spirits come in, the spirit's thoughts become the person's thoughts. Ellen White talks about that, like, repeatedly. There was one man that was struggling. He, he was in ministry. 
and he was in a tent at a camp meeting next to the tent she was in and she said she wrote to him and she said I saw you when you were sitting in the tent and she said Christ spoke to me and said he's under the power of demons and she told him this is what you've done this is where this is leading but Christ wants to set you free and she said you could exercise all of your powers for God's work if you were not uttering the sentiments of Satan who has possessed you. The sentiments, the thoughts, the feelings. You know, that day when I was angry at God and I got up and walked out, it wasn't my thoughts. Those were the devil's thoughts that were inside of me. And that demon was called bitterness. It's scary because the other side of this coin, the other face of bitterness, um, is rebellion. And I'm not going to... I don't want to give it all away, but I'll, I'll give you a piece of it. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. When you look up the word rebellion, the root, the root word in Hebrew is bitterness. It's bitterness. You're bitter towards God. When we rebel against God, we are bitter toward Him. The Bible even says that in Jeremiah chapter 2. It says, it is a bitter thing and an evil thing that you have rebelled against the, the voice of the Lord. So, are, are we bitter? And that can happen in, in lots of different ways. His life in exchange for ours. He has to come into us. And that happens through the Holy Spirit. I don't have to be able to explain it, but I know from John chapter 14 that when the Spirit of God comes into us, that's the mind and power and presence of Jesus and the mind and power and presence of Almighty God. They have to come into us. And when they come in, their thoughts become our thoughts. Their feelings become our feelings. Their emotions become our emotions. But God does that only as we yield, only as we surrender, and as we believe. We have to believe that He will do what He said He will do. None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. Do you know what pride is? I'm going to tell you from my own experience. Pride is not simply arrogance. Pride is saying... I'm better than this. I deserve better than this. I don't deserve what happened to me. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think about that. I've read stories about... Um, I read one story about a woman that was raped by a man. And she went home after the man had been caught and was already in prison. She went home and she started really seeking the Lord because she said, I can't live with this bitterness. You know what, you know what the Lord did when He set her free? she went and started giving Bible studies and taking food to that man that had raped her in prison. And she won him to Christ. I mean, like, he was a totally converted man. Broken and... Un and you're thinking, how could she do that? It's only by the grace and power of God. Pride is saying, I deserve better than this. Jesus. Jesus deserved better than that, didn't he? So who do I think that I'm better than Jesus? I didn't deserve that. Well, neither did Jesus. There's nothing that we have experienced that He has not experienced worse. None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. We cannot save ourselves. And remember, the word saved or salvation means freedom, deliverance, healing, rescue, restoration. You can't heal yourself. You can't set yourself free. We cannot regenerate ourselves. In the heavenly courts there will be no song sung to me that loved myself and washed myself, redeemed myself. Unto me be glory and honor, blessing and praise. But this is the key note of the song that is sung by many here in this world. They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart. And they do not mean to know this if they can avoid it. The whole gospel is comprised in learning of Christ. 
His meekness and lowliness. I didn't understand that. I mean, you know, obviously I know Jesus was humble, but that's as far as it went. Let me show you what the Lord showed me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That burden of bitterness or resentment or rebellion or sin, it, it's like a 500-pound backpack. It wears us out. Wow. He says, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and... What's that phrase? Mm -hmm. Learn of me. Most Christians read that and they say he's going to teach us doctrine. This is what we're supposed to learn. I'm, I'm learning doctrine. He says, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Who was Christ yoked to? His Father. He said, I and my Father are one. What He wants us to learn of Him is how to be meek and dependent instead of arrogant and full of pride and I can do it myself. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am. In the King James it says, I am He, but the word He is supplied. It's not there in the Greek. It's in italicis. He says, Then you'll know that I am. That's the name of Almighty God. What does it say about God's people in the very last days? They will have their Father's name written in their foreheads. Your conscience. I am because He is. The Bible says, as He is, so are we in this present world. He says, when you've lifted me up, then you shall know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself. That's literal. He said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, He's doing the works. Amen. Every person that Jesus healed, every person that He set free from demons, it was the Father in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. And that's what Jesus wants us to know. Ellen White says that. She says, when you become one with Christ, you become one with the Father, one with God, because that's what He did on Calvary. Atonement, at one meant with God. Then He said... Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Nicodemus knew this. He told him in John chapter 3, no man can do the things that we see you do except the Father be with him. And the word with in the Greek can be in. Colossians 1, it says in you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. Is that past tense or future tense? The whole New Testament says we've been reconciled. The whole New Testament says we have been justified. God is telling us, believe me and walk like it. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight to whom God would make known what is the riches of this glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope and assurance of glory. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the revealing of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember what John 17, 3 says? This is life eternal that they might know thee. Adam knew his wife Eve and they twain became one flesh. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. That's what He wants for us. That's what the Apostle Paul writes to us here. It says, God has given the revealing of the knowing of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ.
but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Yes. Always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. You know what that looks like? The Bible says in that he died, Jesus died unto sin once. Romans 6, verse 10 and 11. Always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means when the sin of unforgiveness or resentment or bitterness or rebellion, whatever that sin is, when it comes to you, you speak out loud, I am dead and my life is hid with Christ in thee. Amen. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus because Jesus is in them. Let me ask you a question. Where's your brain? What part of the body is the brain in? In your head. Okay, the Bible says Christ is the head and we are the body. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. When I withhold forgiveness, I put my hand up to Christ and I say, I'm not, I'm not going to let you in this part of my life. But I still want you, but just not this part. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, so that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in your mortal flesh. That's not just here, you know, at the second coming. It means now. The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works and keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. It can't be your own strength. It can't be your own works. It has to be Christ. It has to be God's works in you. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or an improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. The carnal mind is enmity against God. That means the one that has never been born again. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. If we give people a set of rules without them being born again, we are asking them to do the impossible. And what will happen is they'll wind up getting tired of trying and they'll leave Christ and they'll leave the church. Instead of giving the rules first, we need to give them Christ first. We need, to, we need to show them how to be begotten again. And then we say, oh yeah, by the way, as a son and daughter of God, this is how we live. We're free. We get one day a week off guaranteed every single week. Apart from Christ, I'm sorry, human nature could not keep the law even if it would. Apart from Christ, without union with Him, we can do nothing. The Savior took upon Himself the infirmities, the weaknesses of humanity, and He lived a sinless life so that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature they could not overcome. Christ took man's nature, Ellen White says, after 4,000 years of transgression. The Bible says that in Hebrews chapter 1, and it says it in Romans chapter 8. He took sinful nature, but he also had the divine nature that was given to him from his Father. And it was through the divine nature that he overcame. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature. And his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not continue to sin. Amen. Not until the life of Christ becomes a vitalizing power in our lives 
can we resist the temptations that assail us from within and from without unless we accept the atonement provided for us in the remedial sacrifice of Christ who is our atonement our at one -ment with God no genuine reform can be affected human barriers against natural and cultivated tendencies are but as the sandbank against the torrent but by becoming one with Christ man is made free Amen. subjection to the will of Christ means restoration to perfect manhood Amen. when I'm facing irritation the guy behind me in the big truck like I told you in Sabbath school um, I mean I was irritated and I grit my teeth and I didn't say anything I didn't roll my window down but my heart was still wanting to do you understand what I mean I mean like in, in my heart I was thinking you know if this had been 10 years ago I would stop his car and yank you out of that big truck and and, and you know what and God was like there you go Eric I'm, I'm allowing this to happen to you because I'm showing something that's still there that you need to be free from and so then I had to say, God, I'm willing to die. I would rather die than experience those feelings. I'd rather die than, than um, entertain those thoughts. And when I said that and I told the Lord, forgive me for what I did to that man and help him forgive me, he took it. All those thoughts disappeared and all the ugliness. And we have to fight every day. But we win every day in Christ I think these are the last two and, and pay attention to these when the soul surrenders surrenders Jesus is knocking and he's saying if you'll open the door I'll come in when you surrender that means you open the door you surrender your will I'd rather die than this person go to hell no matter what they did to me I forgive them I'm willing to suffer the pain that that person has caused me it doesn't mean you have to be best friends with them but it means you can be free to care about them even as Jesus did when the soul surrenders itself to Christ a new power takes possession of the new heart wait a minute when you get Jesus you get a new mind when you get Jesus you get a new heart when you get Jesus you get faith when you get Jesus you get righteousness we need Jesus Amen. not the things we need the man Amen. a change is wrought which man or woman can never accomplish for themselves it is a supernatural work bringing a supernatural element into human nature I'm going to show you this last slide how that happens the soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress which he holds in a revolted world and he intends that no authority shall be known in you but his own a soul that is thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan Satan is a liar so when he speaks it's lies Jesus is the truth he's the Word of God so when the lie comes I speak the truth but unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ we shall be dominated by the wicked one that's a scary thought here's here's the key to the whole thing your part is to put your will on the side of Christ when you yield your will to his he immediately takes possession possessions what the, the wicked people do right they get possessed by evil spirits that is a counterfeit of what God and Christ want to do he immediately takes possession of you and works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure your nature is brought under the control of his spirit even your thoughts are subject to him if you cannot control your impulses 
If you cannot control your emotions as you may desire, you can control the will. And thus an entire change will be wrought in your life. When you yield up your will to Christ, your life is hid with Christ in God. It is allied to the power which is above all principalities and powers. You have a strength from God that holds you fast to His strength. And a new life, even the life of faith, is possible to you. Amen. So that means I make the choice to do it whether I feel it or not. God will give the feelings. But He doesn't want you to rely on the feelings. You make the choice to do God's will instead of your will. And then you trust Him because it has to be done in faith. It can't be just be an external compliance. I'm not going to work on Saturday. But I'm not keeping the Sabbath in my heart. That won't count for anything. I bought my wife roses. But I really wish I could have found them cheaper. What good is that? I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? My heart's not there. God says, Jesus says in Proverbs, He says, My son, my daughter, give me thine heart, your affections. When you do that and you yield your will to Him, He will change your thoughts. Amen. Amen. Take a picture of this if you have your phone. Um... Back a, a number of years ago, my wife and I ordered, this was that book that I battled with God about reading. Um, we ordered a hundred of them. I think, and this was back years ago, I think they charged us like $2 or $3 a booklet. Um, it, it's a large booklet, easy to read. Um, the website there is ccmbooks.org, bookstore. They also have it available for free on the internet. So you can go right to their website, you can download it as a PDF, put it on your computer, or you can call that number, which is 1-208-883-0997. Just call them and tell them that you want the large, and tell them the picture on the front of the book, because they've got a smaller version that's more of like a, a track, but you want the big one. Um, you won't regret it. You will not regret it. It's the best book that I've ever read on freedom from unforgiveness, resentment. Glad you read it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Would somebody... Actually, let me leave that up. Would somebody mind closing in prayer for us?